The Unshackled Waves, episode 168. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Now obviously, being an Australian-based media organisation, we tend to focus on the the day-to-day happenings in Australia and politics and news here, but uh, we also uh, follow what's happening around the world, including uh, the United States. Obviously, uh, the Unshackled was founded when the the Trump train was uh, full steam, and we actually haven't had an Unshackled Waves episode for a while when we've commented on the the latest developments in the United States and the Trump administration. So now with uh, several uh, news coming out of the the Trump uh, White House, I thought now would be the perfect time, and I thought the person to speak to would be Deputy Editor of The Unshackled, Emilio Garcia. Emilio, welcome back to the show. All right, thanks for having me. Now, uh, because of your uh, joint US and Mexican citizenship, we consider you our US uh, politics expert, uh, like it or not. And we actually haven't Oh, I haven't done a show on US politics for a while, but of course, uh, Trump uh, keep, uh, keeps us uh, interested and he's doing yeah. interesting things all the time, uh, if I'll put it that way. So I thought it, thought it was about time we did a Trump update episode. Uh, yeah, I mean, with everything that's been happening, I, I'm surprised it took this long. Now, obviously, the, the big development in U.S. politics was the uh, pending retirement of U.S. Uh, Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, he was appointed way back by President Ronald Reagan. Now, despite him being appointed by a Republican, he was considered the swing justice on the Supreme Court because it's always been four liberal-leaning justices and then four uh, conservative-leaning justices. And he was the, the decider. That was actually a Time magazine. Uh, cover. He uh, supported, yeah. or he's a supporter of um, abortion, legal abortion. He yeah. uh, wrote the the decision that legalized same sex marriage in the United States. However, he also supports free speech. He su- uh, s- supported the Citizens United uh, decision, mm-hmm. which uh, allowed for more electoral spending. And he also is a supporter of the the Second Amendment. He uh, also voted to overturn the. Uh, uh, weapons ban in the District of Columbia. Right. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, the guy The guy has uh, some lefty leanings and some conservative leanings, and that's why people were saying that he was a swing vote. But I think uh, overall he was elected supposedly as a very conservative option, and then it turns out that uh, conservatives just went on to have a really complicated relationship with him because he, he voted for things that weren't uh, necessarily very conservative. So I think that a lo- what people say about Kennedy is that he seemed to vote in part based on, uh, on what a, a Supreme Justice should, which is basically, is it constitutional and is it legal? And then the other part of him was maybe a little bit more to do with, uh, with his sensibilities, political sensibilities and social sensibilities. And that's why he was, uh, he was such a, a wild card, if you will. But now, uh, obviously, he's retiring, and the idea is what is going to happen uh, with this new appointee. Is he going to be a swing vote? Is he going to be a, a, a standard conservative one? Because it seems like he's not exactly the conservative judge that people were, were thinking Donald Trump was going to appoint. Or the uh, conservatives that progressives were fearing. I mean, they had a massive uh, freak out. They were all feeling... Uh, fearing that uh, Roe versus Wade, which is the 1973 decision which legalized abortion in the United Mm -hmm. States and its subsequent uh, decision, uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, which uh, uh, prevented undue burdens uh, being placed on access to uh, abortion. Um, So yeah, they they freaked out. And I I know that there were a lot of conservatives who were rubbing their hands and say, ha ha, we're going to (laughs) remake the the Supreme Court in our image. Or just you wait until Ruth uh, Bader Ginsburg uh, says she's uh, retiring. We're going to be able to uh, sweep this court for a generation. Yeah, well, I mean, here's the thing about, uh, especially about Roe versus Wade seems to be kind of misunderstood. The idea is that once Roe versus Wade was decided, then blanketly across the U.S., uh, abortion was uh, now a viable option 
for anyone who wanted it. And that's not really the case. What, what it decided, what Roe versus Wade decided, which a lot of people argue is constitutionally inept because it's not in there, is that a woman's, a person's right to privacy included a woman's right to do with her body what she pleased. And that was also, that also included abortion. And so, and thus women had a constitutionally uh, protected right to have an abortion. Obviously, conservatives say that, that that's nonsense, that, that there's like no, the, the, the framers would have never thought that privacy included abortion. Obviously, though, uh, to, to people on the left, they think, well, this is fantastic because it, it essentially establishes that abortions are uh, constitutionally protected. That being said, the, uh, if you actually look at the landscape of the U.S., the states uh, still have a lot of control over abortion. So, for example, in Ohio the regulations are so, so tight that it, it's essentially illegal. I think there's one abortion clinic in the whole state. And uh, yeah, no, no, I think, no. So they closed the last abortion. Sorry, sorry, I had a little bit of a, <laughs> of a blank uh, mind there. So they closed the last abortion clinic down. There was the last one there because they started setting all these new regulations on top of what an abortion clinic needed to look like and what standards it needed to meet. Uh, so it's basically, and, and California, obviously, and New York have super liberal uh, abortion laws. And basically there, you know, you can just basically walk into a Planned Parenthood clinic at an abortion and then walk out like it's nothing. So to say that Roe versus Wade is this really important uh, underlying law that is going to either completely disallow or completely allow abortions is a little bit of uh, misconstruing the facts. Well, it comes from the, the right to privacy. It comes from the, the due process clause under the 14th uh, Amendment. So it's, it's very much uh, the, the decisions on abortion. It's, what, it's what's called the, I, I think, the, the growing tree interpretation of the, the Constitution that it's ever uh, evolving, which is mm. not how you're supposed to interpret a, a, a Constitution. I mean, there, there is no right to abortion uh, right. written in the US Constitution. There's no right to same-sex marriage uh, written in the, in, in the Constitution, but it hasn't stopped the, the Supreme Court ruling in this way. But the, the reason why this decision is so uh, precious to uh, liberals and progressives is because they they don't <laughs> care about the 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 process how you get abortion legal they just want it by any means necessary right. so if we can get it legal through uh, a group of unelected judges then uh, that's good enough for us well that's essentially the big divide between uh, conservatives and and liberals in the U.S. which is essentially the conservatives say that the, the constitution is not a, a living document. It needs to be interpreted as is. And any laws that you want to pass have to be passed through Congress ratified. And if you want to make a change to the constitution, if there's something within the constitution that does not apply anymore, then you have to get the states to vote on it and then amend the constitution. But this, so that's the difference between kind of being an originalist and then kind of being of the, of the growing tree uh, mentality. And so obviously to, to people on the left, they're thinking uh, the, the, the court was basically this you know, group of nine all powerful people that would do their political bidding for them. On the, on the right, they wanted to just uh, kind of establish uh, only what the constitution was meant to, uh, to accomplish in its initial uh, glory, let's say. And so that's why right now there's a debate between conservatives saying, why didn't Donald Trump go for a far more conservative guy? Because this uh, this new guy, uh, he's he's uh, had several opinions that kind of yeah. Mean... Well, we'll introduce him properly. So uh, Brett yeah. Kavanaugh, he's fifty three mm -hmm. years old, which is considered young uh, for a uh, justice, considering that. Uh, that a lot of them uh, don't don't retire until they're in their eighties or yeah. die. Uh, <laughs> He was, he worked in the, the office of the uh, independent council uh, in the 90s. He was co-author of the, the Star Report, which uh, okay. helped uh, impeach uh, Bill Clinton. But uh, I don't think that he was part of any get Cl Clinton operation because let, let, let's uh, remember that uh, uh, Clinton made his own bed with uh, yeah. his uh, perjury and other uh, sexual harassment uh, suits there. And then yeah. he was uh, associate counsel under the the Bush administration, which 
it's worth pointing out now that uh, progressives, they actually don't think it was that bad of an administration. So working yeah. for, for Bush, that's that, that should it's be sort a of a tick anymore. for them. And he was also a, a law clerk for, for Justice Kennedy uh, himself. And it's interesting in his... Uh, Oh, he's in, when he was nominated, he said that mm. he'd be an originalist, but he would also respect precedent, saying that I'm not going to radically alter how the Constitution's right. already been interpreted. Well, here's the thing about, uh, especially that, that that's kind of like one of the one of the issues between conservatives and lefties that they kind of you know it gets it gets muddy because because no one really knows a, a standard answer for it. So the the idea of precedent is that if it has been established before, if the Constitution has been established in this way or interpreted in this way at some point, there has to be some weight given to that. So even if the, uh, a similar case comes to the Supreme Court that would completely overturn that previous interpretation, uh, you can't overturn it without taking into consideration the precedent that has been established already. So what, uh, what lefties are saying now is basically anyone who overturns Roe versus Wade uh, even if it's sound, let's say constitutionally, uh, it would be wrong because they're not they're not uh, respecting the precedent. However, sometimes court, uh, Supreme Courts have to go against precedent because sometimes the decisions have been bad. There was a Supreme uh, Court decision some time ago. I don't remember the name of it, but it essentially established that Black people can never be citizens of the United States. That's, yeah. what, that's what the Supreme Court came to. Dredd versus Scott. That's it. Dred but Scott. that was and overturned by the subsequent uh, Reconstruction amendments after the Civil War. Exactly. And I don't think there would be a lot of lefties right now saying that, oh, well, that was not very good because they didn't respect president. I mean, that, no, of course. Like, th So that's the kind of like the fine line to walk. Uh, if I had to put my money on it, I would say that this guy would probably vote to overturn Roe versus Wade because, I mean, you can take whichever... Uh, point of view you want on abortion itself but to say that it's constitutionally protected that just doesn't make sense again you can be you can be pro-choice fine but i don't think anyone who's intellectually honest would see the 14 page document that is the constitution and say oh here here's where the framers were thinking about a woman's right to choose to have an abortion of course not but then again uh, as i said earlier it's not really going to change the 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 abortion situation in the U.S. all that much. California will continue to have uh, very liberal uh, abortion rights, uh, Texas and Ohio, uh, Mississippi probably. They will also continue to have very restrictive or completely outlaw it now that it's, uh, now that it's an option. But I mean, it was basically illegal, illegal there already to begin with. So again, it's, it's not that big a deal. The only thing that it does is it sets the framework for whether or not there can be a, an all-out uh, ban. And right now, since it's considered a, a constitutional right, lefties can move for an all-out blanket, um, a, how, how would you say it, uh, legal right, something that states can't go against. Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, conservatives have never wanted the Supreme Court to basically flip and say abortion is illegal throughout the, the United States. They want it to, as conservatives uh, normally want is the the states to decide their their own laws. If California, you know, wants uh, legal abortion on demand, like yeah, I think that's a horrible uh, uh, policy to have. But that's uh, California. But yeah, the conservative right. states such as uh, Texas, they they should be able to protect the unborn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, and again, I, uh, I, I've, I've said always uh, many times that I have a complicated uh, relationship with abortion, so I won't, uh, I won't dive into that too much. But essentially, what you have to see is uh, when it comes to the Supreme Court, do you want to have a bunch of people that are politically motivated for a generation, or do you want a group of people that are going to adhere to the, uh, the Constitution as it was supposed to be interpreted from the very beginning? And I will say that the latter has the, the strongest case to be made. It's... Uh, there's no politics behind it. It is essentially we are going to we are going to interpret the constitution as it was meant to be interpreted. And right now, for example, I think a lot of people are, are saying that actually Trump came out with this guy who you know has a really good record with women and minorities and is rather uh, moderate as a strategy to make uh, Democrats look stupid 
because they knew if they if they went they came out with another Gorsic, you know, it would be a uh, Gorsic. Uh, it would be a, a horrible thing, and you know, here's another super conservative guy, and you know, he's just stacking the 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 courts to make you know a Trump's America, you know, actually like uh, like a Trump America, like a dictatorship. But he comes out with a guy who's actually very moderate and very respected. And so right now, when all the the lefties are screaming bloody murder, they just look stupid. They they look they look um, how would you say? It, it just looks disingenuous. It looks like they will oppose anyone for the sake of opposing Donald Trump's agenda. And I think it's working. But a lot of conservatives are saying, like, given that Democrats were, were going to oppose whoever uh, <laughs> Trump put up, I mean, Jimmy Kimmel said, oh, I reckon you'll nominate uh, Lord Voldemort for this uh, <laughs> uh, Supreme Court. Like, why not just go out and uh, appoint the, the most conservative uh, justice you can find. Uh, there were a name thrown about was uh, Amy Cohen Barrett. Uh, she was rumored to. Uh, uh, she's a uh, law professor. She's a uh, conservative Catholic of uh, seven children. Every everybody said she would be the dream uh, candidate. But uh, Brett Kavanaugh, uh, he's a, uh, I should have mentioned he's a federal circuit court judge at the moment. Everyone was saying, like, why not just because uh, this is what conservatives wanted. This is why they mm. voted for Trump, even though they didn't consider Trump uh, a conservative. I mean, he right. certainly uh, didn't live his uh, personal life uh, like a, a conservative, but they voted for him because they wanted him to reshape the Supreme Court for uh, a generation. And they thought that with uh, the appointment of Neil Gorsuch, that they uh, would have that. And that's why they were really excited when Justice Kennedy retired. But now they're getting basically somebody who's... Uh, Kennedy's being replaced by Kennedy, basically. <laughs> and is this Trump maybe showing his liberal Democrat side again? So, I, first of all, I think that he's going to be uh, far more of a constitutionalist than Kennedy. Uh, but the reason that that Trump didn't go just for the most conservative guy right now is because we have to remember that there are midterm elections now in the United States. And sure, maybe getting a very conservative person would help Donald Trump exclusively, but there are a lot of, uh, of elections going on in a lot of very diverse places. And so you have to take into consideration that there are uh, Republicans that will have Democratic constituents vote for them. There are people who are Republicans and will vote for a, demo, a, a Republican candidate, but that are pro-choice. And so right now, if it seems that um, that they are going to vote on a, uh, on a on a justice that is unsavory to a large swath of American people that then might actually uh, hand over more seats to the Democrats, well, then that's not a very good thing. So that's what people are saying. You need to hand right now they're trying to handle at a, at a, at a party level someone who will kind of set the standard for overturning uh, Roe versus Wade and being a constitutionalist while being moderate enough that you can also get a lot of um, a lot of the more moderate Republicans to vote on him and 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 keep their uh, and keep their their base and also uh, kind of appease some of the middle of the road people the voters themselves well it's called the being called the establishment's uh, choice, and mm -hmm. all, uh, there's already a whole swag of uh, senior uh, Republican uh, senators who've said they'll support uh, his appointment. At the moment, the Senate is finely balanced, uh, 51 for the Republicans, uh, 49 for the, uh, the, uh, the Democrats. It's, the, the Democrats have said, oh, we automatically uh, oppose him. But as you said before, it looks tricky given how moderate he is to, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, like, if they knock him back, I mean, then Trump can say, "Oh, well, I'm going to, you know, appoint the uh, a really conservative person." Uh, right. Cop that. No, man. I mean, honestly, right now we've seen with Democrats, they really are right now in the business of opposing Trump for opposing Trump. I mean, it seems quite obvious to me because I remember uh, when the whole DACA uh, fiasco started, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals which essentially allowed kids who arrived in the U.S. illegally to stay as long as they had arrived um, as children, that Donald Trump said, you know what, I'm going, you guys want us to uh, give citizenship to 600,000 kids, I'll give uh, citizenship to 800,000 kids. And not only, or I think it was even something like maybe 1 million kids, something like that. We'll give them 1, 1 million and you know, we'll give them legal status and voting rights and all I want you to do is pay for the wall. And the, the Democrats came back and said, this is a plan to make America white again as if it were some you know, white supremacist uh, agenda that would actually want to legalize more 
people than the Democrats initially were asking for. And the same thing goes here. I mean, he 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 extended an olive branch in a sense. He 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 could have gone for someone completely super super conservative and had everyone vote for him and have him go through without a hitch. And instead, he went for a moderate guy. But you still have people out there saying this guy is essentially akin to a Nazi. He is far right. He is going to rep repeal uh, Roe versus Wade, and he's going to, you know, basically make women go out with. Uh... Oh, the the other conspiracy theory that I think was put forward by Cory Booker that uh, Trump <sighs> nominated him to uh, protect him from impeachment. Not from impeachment. From uh, from being uh, impeached so, from being while not. Yeah, while well, in yeah, office. Yeah, yeah. So the issue is that uh, he basically wrote that sitting presidents should not be uh, should not be basically burdened with criminal uh, charges because presidents are so busy and they have so much to do that to take on a legal battle that takes you know over a year uh, just basically hinders their ability to do anything uh, productive. And what they were saying is essentially when Bill Clinton was going through uh, this whole impeachment proceeding that he probably could have done a lot better work in the Middle East, but couldn't because he had to prepare uh, legally for, uh, for the battle that he ultimately lost. One really key piece of information there is that he said that that should not be a decision for the courts to make, and that it should be ratified through Congress to say, can we indict a sitting president, go through the, the lower house, go through the upper house, Donald Trump signs the law, and then it's law. But, but, but Cory Booker, first of all, he wants to run for president that's that's pretty obvious most people know that he has presidential aspirations so right now it seems that they think that as long as they are the ones that shout the loudest and they're the ones that hate trump the most they will win and right now i will say uh i've never been on the trump train uh i started going a little bit more in his direction uh a few a few months ago when he was doing some really good things right now he's reversed himself so he's making it a lot easier to to be bashed by the democrats so i think that he's also kind of messing himself up there and now uh, conservatives, they're, they're not believing that we're going to change the Supreme Court for a generation because uh, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts, he was another George W. Bush uh, appointment. He's turned into quite a moderate on the uh, Supreme Court. I mean, let's not forget he was the deciding vote in upholding Obamacare. Uh, he mm -hmm. said that it wasn't a individual mandate, it was a uh, tax, yeah. and so that got Obama's signature policy uh, through. Uh, mm -hmm. There's also, uh, as I mentioned before, Ruth B Bader Ginsburg, she's 85. Uh, people are wondering when she'll uh, retire, will she hold out to see if uh, yeah. Trump loses? Another liberal justice, uh, Stephen Breyer, is 79, mm -hmm. and probably the most uh, conservative uh, remaining uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, he's yeah. 70, so, and let's not forget uh, Scalia uh, died in his uh, mid-70s, right. so uh, there, it's, it's still, the the Supreme Court should, could still be shaped in, in any direction, and we, uh, as I pointed out with uh, John Roberts, he hasn't been the uh, conservative that everyone thought he would be, right. because let, let, uh, let's remember that once they're on the Supreme Court, they're not, they're not accountable to the president mm -hmm. who appointed them they they're, they're appointed for life they can make their own decisions and mm -hmm. and this could definitely be the same with uh, Brett Kavanaugh yeah well I mean right now they're even saying that there should be a, a 20 year limit for uh, Supreme Court justices I don't think that's the worst idea in the world to be honest well in Australia we have uh, compulsory retirement of high court judges at 70 that, that seems reasonable to me the thing is essentially uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with moderation in it like in itself and i don't think that there is a problem with having a diversity of opinion within the courts and i don't think that having a counterweight between a lot of uh, different political points of view or legal points of view rather because it's not supposed to be political is a bad thing for the supreme court the issue is when you have people that are purely political so sotomayor she's a, a political agent i mean anyone who sees her decisions and does not think that she is an absolute lefty political agent would just be have to be blind to themselves and then you have people like uh, like it seems like kennedy they're not political actors they just have a diversity of thought and then you have obviously the more conservative ones who are the originalists that that the, that the conservatives really like so i can see why a lot of people are upset because they're saying you know we were promised a bunch of originalists and conservatives in the courts and right now he has the chance to do this you know before anyone even thought, you know, they thought that the next appointment was going to be to replace uh, Ginsburg, and it's not. 
and he comes back with a really moderate guy. I don't think this is awful though. This this guy, he has a long track record of making good decisions. He seems like a person who has diversity of thought, but he's also he's also intelligent, he's reasonable. So yeah, okay, it might not be exactly what everyone wanted, but he gets the job done well. He's a conservative and he's a, 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 a constitutionalist. And I think in those two senses, when it comes to, to the constitution especially, you want someone who's a conservative, who, who understands the status quo, and who is an originalist, who doesn't think it's a, it's a living, breathing document. I think that's fine. Well, he's also not strong on uh, civil liberties as well. So uh, the libertarian with me is not impressed with, with, with that regard. And as a pro-lifer myself, I'm mm -hmm. yeah, obviously disappointed that it looks like Roe versus Wade is, uh, at, the, at the very best, it's going to be slightly modified to allow uh, more um, pr uh, protections in place for the uh, the unborn. So mm -hmm. it, it looks like it's going to be pretty much uh, business as usual for, for the court, which it, which it, which it has been for. Uh, I mean, it all seems to sort of work out in the end. There's four mm -hmm. conservative justices, four liberal ones, and then uh, the decider, or oh, now it looks like we might have two deciders, two deciders. considering how moderate Roberts is becoming. Again, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I understand everyone's uh, plight with, with this. I think that everyone thought, you know, Trump is going to basically bring in his sister and, you know, overturn Roe versus Wade. It's <laughs> going to be fantastic. But, but I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, listen, it seems like this guy being an originalist, if, uh, if there is a case that manages to get to the Supreme Court, that would, that which decision would overturn Roe versus Wade, I think that he would vote to repeal it. Not, be, not because I'm saying that it's the right or the wrong thing to do, but because it's not in the constitution that a woman should have an abortion. So I don't think that that's something that, that should worry people so much. What I don't know is when is another case gonna come around that will have standing, appropriate standing at all levels that the Supreme Court will have to rule on it and rule in that direction. It's not that easy. It's not like tomorrow uh, the, the Republican Party can just you know take a, a case up to the Supreme Court. There's several steps and the Supreme Court doesn't necessarily hear every single case that comes uh, past them. So, so I mean, I think, I think it was a lot of wishful thinking. I think there was a lot of wishful thinking on behalf of conservatives that thought that the second that this new guy came in, he would just, you know, completely overturn it and everything was going to be wonderful and it was going to be you know uh the, the the america that everyone dreams of and it's not that simple it's just not and i will say once again i don't think that there's a problem with moderation and i don't think that there's a problem with having diversity of opinion uh now uh trump he, he made the announcement uh, of the appointment uh, or nomination i should say earlier in the week but he's he's now gone over to europe he's in belgium at the moment for uh, NATO talks, where he's previously said that uh, uh, the other NATO countries in Europe need to pay their their fair share. He's uh, uh, also uh, said that while he's while he's there, uh, he 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 doesn't just talk the talk on on Twitter and over in the United States when he meets Merkel and the other European leaders, he still tells them uh, what what he thinks. Uh, and he he's also gone as far as to say, hey, like these European nations, they should be paying the United States money they mm -hmm. owe us yeah that 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 was one of the mistake one of one of the mistakes that he made i think he doesn't understand that nato isn't uh it's not like everyone puts money into a little pot and then that's the defense budget it's everyone's supposed to contribute a certain percentage of their gdp so i guess you can make the stretch to say that you know because they haven't contributed what they said they were going to contribute it's hyperbole yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, I, but I, I understand his sentiment. And even people, I will say, I've been very surprised. I listen to a lot of lefty news, uh, specifically Anderson Cooper, just because I really like to get all, all sides of the, of the debate. Uh, and he's the most radical one I can find. And even people on his show and he himself are saying, well, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That one thing that Trump is saying that all other NATO partners have to give their fair share that's true. They're saying that it's because uh, it, the broken clock conundrum, I think it's called. Yeah, right? twice he, a day. Yeah, twice a day. So it's just like by accident, he's, he's right about it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, th there, I don't think there's a lot of argument. I think there is a lot of argument in terms of Trump being a little bit more presidential when it comes to his allies. Uh, and especially, you know, just, just kind of the optics of everything, which, uh, you know, at this point in history, uh, it seems like that's, uh, 
it's, ever it's, less and less important. It's the art of the deal strategy. I mean, yeah. Mm. Uh, he, he didn't he, even write that book, but. <laughs> but but it's he he, he lives its uh, mantra. I mean, mm. uh, we keep, I keep having to point out that he was elected to be an unconventional uh, president. And even with friends, you've got to be a bit tough from time to time. That's true. I mean, it turns out that he has a pretty uh, happy relationship with uh, with Macron, who uh, who would have thought? Uh, yeah. So yeah, listen, I, I I understand his point of view. It's not like he has, you know, he's not nuking Germany. He's criticizing them. It's not it's not a horrible. There's all those U.S. Tro troops in Germany. Sorry. There's all those U.S. troops in Germany. Yeah, and then he also made the fair point, even though it's not directly Merkel's fault, but he made the fair point that uh, that. Merkel, uh, well, that Germany is super reliant on Russia, mm. and that the fact that that it seems hypocritical and it seems strategically unintelligent to uh, have uh, an adversary and also have uh, be be completely dependent on them in terms of of your energy supply. So he said that, and again, people weren't saying that he was wrong; they were saying that he was wrong in how he said it. And I agree with them. I I, I do I do long for the days of some you know uh, presidential character and a little bit of finesse. But I don't think that it's as big a deal as people are making it out to be. Like, this is Donald Trump. We already knew who he was. And, you know, words like sticks and stones may break our bones. Like, he didn't say, I'm declaring war on you. He was criticizing them. It's not that big a deal. I think he could have done a little bit better. I think if he'd moder if he had kind of been a little, you know, bring some of that Trumpiness, but a little bit more pulled back. And, you know, he, it would have also done well to understand uh, the, how the financials of NATO work. That also would have made him look a little bit more prepared. No, you owe us money. It's like, no, that's not how it works. Donald, like no one gave you a brief on this. So yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, the it, error of the statesman is over. Sorry. The error of the statesman is over. It's well, I, I'm sure people are going to come later and they're going to be Trumpy ish, but no one's going to be able to out Trump Trump. There will be a certain, uh, a certain presidentiality that comes with it. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, and to, to a certain degree, that's, that's good. It's good that you can now sit on a sit across uh, from, from another, uh, president, prime minister, or whatever, and tell them what you really think. That that hadn't been the case, and it, it just it just makes everything much slower because you're completely uh, preoccupied with the optics of things and looking good and looking presidential. Whereas you know, with Donald Trump, you know, say what you will about him, if he just comes out and says something and he's not preoccupied with how things are going to be perceived, things might move faster. And you also said, saw this with uh, with Macron. Which I know you and the other people who worked the Unshackled, and probably most of the people watching this really don't like. But when he was on stage with uh, with Vladimir Putin, people generally don't uh, you know they they don't talk trash while they're on stage with another world leader. But he was like, hey, bro, like we need to talk about the shady shit that you're doing when it comes to uh, election meddling. And so yeah, I mean, I think I think that that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, it was interesting that uh, everyone's noticed that, oh, he's not criticizing uh, Russia, uh, Trump, while he's over. He seems to sort of, uh, li like I said, like uh, do a strike in, st uh, in Syria every now and then to say, oh, I'm you know, st standing up to Russia, but then it's yeah. back to uh, 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 playing uh, nice with them. And I think that's why he mm. deflected uh, uh, onto Germany saying, hey, you're saying, you know, I'm in cahoots with Russia. Hey, look at your, uh, you know, gas relationship with them. Right. Listen, with Donald Trump, I, I, it, when it comes to Russia, I don't even know which way to look anymore because, you know, on the one side, he will not say, he will not say a bad thing about Russia. I don't get why. It seems like a perfectly good country and a perfectly good leader to criticize. But then on the other side of it, he has, he has done some pretty, pretty significant things. He's imposed uh, several sanctions on some very, uh, some people very, very close to, to Putin in a really strong way, more than Obama did. And he's also armed the people of Crimea, which is something that Obama failed to do. So I don't, I don't understand the, the dynamic. I don't, I don't know if, if Trump just kind of thinks that Putin is cool and doesn't want to criticize him because he just thinks he's kind of a cool guy. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the Russia situation just kind of uh, has my head spinning. On the one hand, he he does things that are really really tough on them, and then he completely counters that narrative by not being able to utter a single criticism of of, uh, of Russia, in any important way at least. And of course, uh, Trump, while he's in Europe, he's visiting the the United Kingdom. Uh, mm -hmm. Now there's mass uh, protests uh, planned. Uh, uh, Britain has a very uh, active 
uh, left uh, Antifa movement there mm. and, and in preparation uh, somebody has designed an inflatable uh, baby Trump which has been flying uh, everywhere obviously <laughs> hoping that that will get under his skin yeah uh, I mean listen w what can I say I mean let them do it it's that, that's kind of like one of these stories about people thinking that their statements are far more powerful than they are uh, I don't know if you if you've heard of this uh, outlet called now this it's a news outlet owned by by BuzzFeed and uh, anyway they do kind of like these digestible news videos and they they, they 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 report on how some people protest Trump it's like ooh, Trump is gonna hate this you know this guy ate a hamburger out of a of, out of a MAGA hat and this was actually on now this and people were like, oh, yeah, that'll teach him. It's like, I'm sure he doesn't care. And uh, listen, he does have a big ego, and I don't think that he's going to be thrilled at all, you know, driving into London and seeing a bunch of uh, fat, inflatable uh, Trump babies in the sky. But to say that this is a significant thing or that it's actually going to do anything uh, in any real terms to, uh, to coerce his actions, I just, I just think not. I just think people are being stupid and petty. Yeah, the, the left think that this is uh, a grand uh, a d a display of uh, opposition. You, you'll be amazed at how effective they, they think it is. But probably yeah. the more uh, noteworthy thing while uh, he'll be in the UK, Trump, is his meeting with uh, Theresa May because they've had a somewhat tense relationship. Uh, she didn't like the fact that he uh, retweeted those Britain First videos, which showed uh, no Muslim did, violence. <laughs> in oh, I, I, I did. I, I, oh. I liked it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Fair uh, yeah, and so uh, Trump responded to uh, Theresa May criticizing uh, him, saying, "Hey, you, you know, <laughs> you better be uh, careful about, you know, focus on the Muslims in in your country rather than having a go at me." And he, mm. he's also uh, done a few uh, Twitter tirades against the London mayor, uh, Muslim uh, oh, Sadiq yeah. uh, Khan, who's got the uh, trying to undertake knife control at the moment because of there's oh, so God. many knife attra uh, knife attacks. So, yeah, there there there'll be some. Uh, I, I think interesting dialogues uh, between the two, but hey, if uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Donald Trump can be on stage and uh, be best friends after their tense uh, phone call, then perhaps Trump can pull it off with Theresa May as well. Listen, uh, after after Macron was here and he referred to <laughs> to uh, Turnbull's wife as delicious, uh, <laughs> there's really not a high bar for for a state uh, visit going well in Australia. Uh, but yeah, listen, I mean, uh, right now, especially, it's it's kind of fitting that Donald Trump would make his way over to see Theresa May, uh, especially with her her world kind of crumbling around mm. her. I mean, just what has been happening in, in Britain lately is um, is truly unbelievable. I mean, there's just so much chaos. It seems like, you know, I, I, I kind of read the stories from the very beginning. I thought this had happened over the past couple of weeks. It turns out that it happened over the past few days. Uh, so yeah, listen. Uh, I think I think that it's good that he's uh, pointing out the issues that a lot of people tend to ignore that are happening in Britain, especially when it comes to this London mayor who seems to be so much more focused on being remembered as a cool, uh, hip, woke guy than actually protecting the people of his of country. A culturally yeah. enriched city. Uh, yeah, exactly. That that's uh, that's the, he he's more concerned with uh, with those types of slogans than actually doing anything of real significance. So when it comes to that, and I will say, uh, though I'm not in love with uh, Trump's rhetoric sometimes, and I feel like he could handle himself far better, I do see the merit of having someone who is not apologetic, is not concerned with, uh, well, you know, with political correctness, that word gets thrown around, but just basically not concerned with the optics of things and making sure that he's not being offensive. He'll say what he thinks. And that ultimately leads to a conversation uh, in a much more efficient way than if you, you know, using semantics and, you know, kind of, uh, doing, uh, you know, under the table, uh, you know, jabs. So I think that's good. But, uh, in terms of what will actually come in a, in an actual way from his visit, probably nothing tangible, probably nothing that we'll be able to point to and say, that was really good. You see that, that placed some kind of a political pressure that will make uh, Theresa May or, or the government of Britain do this or that. Probably not. I mean, it's, it's, it's just optics. Uh, Trump's probably in a good negotiating position. He he could probably just go in there with Theresa May. So so you need a friend. Uh, I can help <laughs> you out with that. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to to some defense spending, maybe. But um, again, I, I I don't know. Especially, I mean, what 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 exactly is is Trump gonna gonna do for Theresa May in any real way? What what power does he have to help her? 
Mm. Not really I guess much. We'll, we'll find out. Uh, well, we will find out. Yeah. Emilio, it's been great to have you back on the show, but what's happening with your, your own podcast, Front and Center? It's, it's been on indefinite hiatus for quite a while. Yes. Front and Center season three is coming up. Obviously, we've been expanding the business in a pretty significant way and working on a bunch of projects. So I had to put that on pause, but uh, season three is well on, our way, on its way. Uh, the recording of episode four is already happening. So uh, keep waiting and uh, it will definitely be out soon. And of course, uh, you will be in Melbourne this time next week because we're all going to be at the Stefan Molyneux and Lauren Southern event. We're a bit worried that the, the tour might not happen because there was some um, visa limbo for a while, but they're, they're on their way here and yeah. uh, they're, they're going to be uh, visiting uh, all the cities in Australia. They're still trying to get an Auckland venue, but yeah, it's back. Right. It's, it's going it's ahead. It's back on. Yeah, I really wish you hadn't uh, hadn't mentioned to everyone watching that I'm going to be in Melbourne for that event because now the Antifa's know to look for me. Hey, they're, they're, they've got your uh, photo on their uh, anti-fascist Melbourne wall of shame. Oh, do they really? So, yes, they do. I was not aware. I was not aware. I thought I thought I thought I was I, I thought I was moderate enough for them. No, I guess not. No. Well, any nope. any anyone anyone right of Bernie Sanders is a fascist. So mm. you know, I wear it as a, ba a badge of honor. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm really excited. We'll see everyone who will be there. Hopefully, uh, you know, I can, I can meet as many uh, of my fellow alt media people and as many of our audience members as possible. Of course, if you, you can still grab tickets uh, to the, the shows by going to the promoter's website, which is axiomatic.events. Uh, right. And I hope you will. And of course, there's going to be a big change happening to the, the Unshackled website this weekend, where we're yes, going to keep it right. somewhat a uh, surprise, but it's also going to be affecting uh, this show somewhat as well. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, I'll, I, I won't make a whole podcast episode about it, but I will <laughs> uh, give some context to it. So that's our, our big surprise for this weekend. Yeah, hopefully you'll all like it. And of course, uh, we can't do uh, or this podcast or the rest of The Unshackled with, without your support. So please consider uh, becoming a patron of The Unshackled at uh, patreon.com uh, slash The Unshackled. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is really, uh, th these funds really help us operate in a really significant way and create far more content. So if you really can contribute, even a little bit goes a long way. So until next time, thanks for your company. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.